Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, June 23rd, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here is a look at tonight's stories. Tonight, the U.S. and NATO escalate tensions with heavy weapons on the Russian border while our borders are left open, and 3,700 illegal immigrant Threat One criminals are released into the U.S. by Homeland Security. And what about the close KKK ties of the Democrat Party and the FBI? All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. Well, there is presently a controversial debate raging over the Confederate flag and offensive words. Highly volatile debate. It's been going on for decades. And that's why, in fact, Alex Jones didn't even want us to focus on these two topics because he knows that it's just meant to cause division between the races. And that's exactly what's happening. Just last night on CNN, a guest was there to say that the efforts to remove the Confederate flag are cultural genocide. So obviously this is gonna spark a heated debate. Uh, meanwhile, African-Americans and a lot of other people say that that flag is actually a symbol of slavery and all of the suffering that was endured there. So it's a highly volatile, controversial debate been raging for decades and that's exactly why it's taking place because they know this is going to capture the attention of the nation everyone is going to be fighting amongst ourselves rather than going against the state and that's what this whole conquer and divide is always about again and again so so what's going on behind the scenes what are they trying to cover up well obviously one of the big things hillary clinton is not talking about as she's set to go to Ferguson, Missouri, she's putting the issue of race at the forefront of her campaign right now because she's seizing on this, this big debate because she knows it's captured the nation. But Hillary Clinton is not going to talk about the 92 Clinton-Gore campaign buttons that have surfaced showing the Confederate flag. Uh, they have Clinton-Gore there and the Confederate flag. There's also uh, some other buttons there where they show the two of them in Confederate uniforms. So she's not talking about that. Neither is her team responding to questions about the, the act that her husband signed when he was governor of Arkansas in 1987. It was an act honoring the Confederate flag. So she's completely silent about that and once again is just proving to be a major hypocrite. But Kit Daniels takes it a step farther. He says, you know, if we're going to go ahead and ban the Confederate flag, why not ban the Democratic Party for their ties to racism? We've reported this before. Many people don't know. The Ku Klux Klan was created by Democrats. The Ku Klux Klan was created as a terroristic force serving the interests of the Democratic Party and those who desired the restoration of so-called white supremacy. Noted historian Eric Foner writes in his book, Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution, that the Ku Klux Klan was founded in 1866 as a Tennessee social club. It quickly spread into nearly every Southern state and it launched a reign of terror against Republican leaders, black and white. So obviously, you know, that's a little bit of history and if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it and you're doomed to be duped by the people out there who want to use all of this controversy as a political weapon. Now, Kurt Nimmo goes on to report about the FBI's history in infiltrating and driving these racist movements in America. I touched on this a little bit on Friday, talked about, you know, the many useful idiots in the race war and how the FBI, you know, today we can report about them infiltrating mosques looking for their next jihadists. Well, they're doing the same thing in these white supremacist circles, looking for their next hooded jihadi to go out all different sides of the race war, they all need their useful idiots. So when you're in your little racist chat rooms, you might be talking to an FBI agent. Nimmo reports on the White Citizens Council, the Ku Klux Klan, and COINTELPRO. Now in the book, COINTELPRO, The Untold American Story, Paul Wolf documents the role that the FBI played in the Klan. He notes that according to the church committee, more than one quarter of all active Klan members in the 60s were FBI agents or informants. And they weren't neutral observers or objective investigators. They were active participants in beatings, bombings, and murders that claimed the lives of some 50 civil rights activists by 1964. And goes on to explain how the Council of Conservative Citizens, which is of course in the news right now, 
because Dylan Roof was a, a fan of some of the writings there. Uh, but the Council of Conservative Citizens has also donated money to several uh, Republican presidential candidates' campaigns. So a lot of heat there with this Council of Conservative Citizens. Uh, that was formed out of the White Citizens Council and the Klan. They have all worked in concert with the FBI and COINTELPRO. Probably initially in the 60s, they were working uh, to, to neutralize any political social advancement in the black community. But it seems today the agents have a new agenda in mind, which is, of course, fostering racial tension and ultimately a race war in the United States. And that's what we're seeing fester up all around us. It's coming from many different angles. And so what else is really going on while the media has got us fighting amongst ourselves with all of these, this racial debate? I mean, guaranteed, every time an election comes around, you're going to be talking about racism and abortion and gay marriage, because those are the things that continually divide people and get people fighting amongst themselves so that they don't focus on the real issues. One of the big things that we've been reporting about here constantly is that the Senate and the House, Congress is about to give Obama authority to fast track the trade bills that he has been trying to ram through. Him and the next president are gonna be passing these trade bills and these treaties, and if that happens, it's RIP USA. So that's something huge that they're trying to divert us from, from paying attention to. Uh, but something else that's really huge, the US will permanently position heavy weapons on the Russian border. Now this was announced on Monday. Obama's defense boss, Ashton Carter, said that the US will contribute weapons, aircraft, and forces, including commandos for NATO's rapid reaction force. And he hinted that commandos would be used against separatists in Eastern Ukraine. Now this, is, this move is unprecedented. It's the first time since the Cold War that the U.S. has positioned heavy military equipment in Eastern Europe. Less than half of European citizens support this military activity against Russia. It's right there in their backyard. And of course, you know, Putin has already said that he is going to retaliate if the U.S. positions itself uh, around the borders there of Russia. And also, as the U.S. is focusing on all of this domestic strife, ISIS is now ramping up. They're taking a play straight out of the Saw franchise, uh, releasing three more gruesome videos. They're high quality because they want to scare everyone who might have forgotten that ISIS was out there, our biggest threat. You know, anyone had forgotten that we, we are so scared we need to give up more of our, our rights. They release these videos. One segment shows a group of men with explosives wound around their necks. They're then detonated. This is, you know, in order to decapitate them. Uh, in another segment, four men are seen locked in a car. Uh, the car is subsequently blown up by a militant who uses a rocket-propelled grenade. And then in a third segment, it shows five more men locked in a cage and lowered into a swimming pool. And the ISIS militants had fitted this cage with underwater cameras and also cameras in the pool so that they could record the men drowning underwater. So this is just absolute savagery, despicable, and it's our biggest threat. No, it's not the environment and climate change, Obama. According to the House Intel Committee, the U.S. is at the highest threat level that we've ever faced in this country. And that's saying a lot because they haven't said that since 9-11. Now, this threat is coming from the radicalization of young people and foreign fighters that are heading into Iraq and Syria to join these terror groups. Uh, Devin Nunes, who's the House Intel Committee chair, points out that several Americans have already been arrested and charged with being ISIS sympathizers, trying to join this terror group. And Nunes stated that, we are having a tough time tracking terrorist cells within the United States. Huh, so this is our biggest threat, the biggest threat level facing America. Uh, for quite some time. He actually said it's the biggest threat we have ever faced as a country, ever faced. But the president, he's already come out and admitted that this administration has absolutely no plan for dealing with ISIS. But I believe he played four or five rounds of golf this weekend. So, you know, very, very important upping his golf game while ISIS and their sympathizers are you know, ramping up their, their efforts to terrorize the globe. And, you know, people are fighting about flags and words. And you also may have heard about this manhunt 
that's been going on. It's been the 24 hour news cycle all around the clock. They know that this is absolutely captivating the nation, talking about these two men who escaped from this prison, uh, really glamorizing it, um, you know, the Shawshank redemption there. Both of these men were in prison serving time for murder. But so what's the big deal? I mean, <laughs> they're serving time for murder. Is it only a bad thing when murderers escape from prison? I mean, what about the 3,700 threat level one criminals that were released by the Department of Homeland Security? Are we not supposed to worry about those people who have been just released out onto the streets here in America? In 2013, Department of Homeland Security released 36,000 convicted criminals. Those released had amassed 116 homicide convictions. Goes on, they've got drunken driving convictions, uh, ICE labeled some, some nearly 9,000 convictions with dangerous drugs involvement there. Um, that total dropped to 30,000 in 2014, but there was 193 homicide convictions among those detainees, drunken driving, sexual assault, kidnapping convictions. So these people are just being released by ICE. And of the people since 2010, between 2010 and 2014, of those criminal illegal aliens that were released, now 121 of those people have been charged with murder. So we're releasing people that have prior convictions and we're releasing people who then go on to commit murder. Now, most of the illegal immigrant criminals that Homeland Security officials released uh, were discretionary. That means the department could have kept them in detention, but they chose instead to let them onto the streets as their deportation cases were moving through the system. So <laughs> these are the real problems that are going on in this country while we are being diverted to pay attention to other things there in the media with all of this race baiting. But they did manage to catch one border crosser, James O'Keefe. That's right, you remember him, he's a conservative filmmaker. Well, he was detained by US Customs and Border Patrol agents on Monday while he was returning through an airport to US soil. And why? Because he once filmed a video in which he crossed the US-Mexico border without going through customs. And customs agents told him that he will be detained every single time he enters the country from overseas henceforth. And you'll recall, we played that video here uh, on the InfoWars Nightly News. He did it in August. He was dressed like Osama bin Laden. And he was making a point about how easy it would be for Islamic radicals to just pour onto the domestic soil, cross the border. No one would be stopping them. So he embarrassed them and showed how easy it was to penetrate the border. And so now <laughs> they're still not protecting the border. In fact, they're releasing criminals, but they're gonna check him every single time and harass him and give, give him a hard time. You know, meanwhile, violent criminals are crossing the border every single day. Biggs just got back from a vacation and you know, they didn't stop Joe Biggs. So <laughs> we've seen some of his videos there exposing how easy it would be for ISIS and other criminals to cross the border. Now coming up, I'm gonna be speaking with a military veteran about her quest for truth. But first, John Bowne calls out Hillary Clinton on her hypocrisy. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Hillary Clinton. Speaking at the 83rd annual U.S. Conference of Mayors Saturday, the former Secretary of State said she supported President Obama's Thank calls so to further infringe on the Second Amendment if it means it will help Thank the victims you. of gun violence. For me and many others, one immediate response was to ask how it could be possible that we as a nation still allow guns to fall into the hands of people whose hearts are filled with hate. You can't watch massacre after massacre and not come to the conclusion that, as President Obama said, we must tackle this challenge with urgency and conviction. Now, I lived in Arkansas, and I represented upstate New York. I know that gun ownership is part of the fabric of a lot of law-abiding communities, but I also know that we can have common sense gun reforms that keep weapons out of the hands of criminals and the violently unstable while respecting responsible gun owners. 
What I hope with all of my heart is that we work together to make this debate less polarized, less inflamed by ideology, more informed by evidence. So we can sit down across the table, across the aisle from one another, and find ways to keep our communities safe while protecting constitutional rights. It makes no sense that bipartisan legislation to require universal background checks would fail in Congress despite overwhelming public support. It makes no sense that we couldn't come together to keep guns out of the hands of domestic abusers or people suffering from mental illnesses, even people on the terrorist watch list. That doesn't make sense, and it is a rebuke to this nation we love and care about. The President is right. The politics on this issue have been poisoned. But we can't give up. The stakes are too high. The costs are too dear. And I am not and will not be afraid to keep fighting for common sense reforms and, along with you, achieve those on behalf of all who have been lost because of this senseless gun violence in our country. In the immediate aftermath of the shooting, President Obama and Charleston Mayor Joseph P. Riley Jr. both rushed to issue statements demonizing the Second Amendment over the shooter's actions. But let's be clear. At some point, we as a country will have to reckon with the fact that this type of mass violence does not happen in other advanced countries. It doesn't happen in other places with this kind of frequency. Meanwhile, black Americans took to Twitter and rallied around firearms, the Second Amendment, and the God-given right to self-defense, declaring a call to arms in rejection of the white supremacist ideology. Candidate Clinton first made her anti-gun stance clear in April, asserting, we cannot let a minority of people, and that's what it is, it is a minority of people hold a viewpoint that terrorizes the majority of the people. And now from the first comment for this article from John Smith. Hey, Killary, you want common sense gun reform? How about not sending guns to ISIS? How about not sending guns to Mexican drug dealers? How about stopping senseless wars? Now that's gun reform I can live with. John Baum for Infowars.com. Well, there's a saying that if you are not outraged, then you're not paying attention. And now what I'm about to talk with you about today, you might find a little bit upsetting, but that's kind of the point. Hopefully enough people will finally be outraged by rape in the military that we can actually affect some change. So today I'm gonna to be discussing the institutionalized protocol of cover-up of sexual assault in the military, as well as the mistreatment of those people who actually come forward and, and speak out about this. So let's look at some, some pretty shocking statistics. Sexual assault is alarmingly common in the US military one in three women in the U.S. military report being raped or sexually assaulted by their colleagues. Uh, an estimated 26,000 rapes and sexual assault took place in the military in 2012. 2012 is the last year that those statistics are available. And with that, with those 26,000 people that reported that, only one in seven people actually reported their assaults and just one in 10 of those went to trial. Uh, a 2004 study of women veterans from Vietnam and all wars since uh, they were seeking help for post-traumatic stress disorder. They found that 71% of those women said that they were sexually assaulted or raped while serving. And it's not just happening to women. According to the Pentagon, 38 military men are sexually assaulted every single day in the military. But you don't hear about that uh, because... You know, it often goes unreported because men who report being raped by other men in the military could actually be discharged for engaging in homosexual behavior. So this is a problem. It's uh, victims are blamed for reporting the crimes. They're shunned by their colleagues, uh, if not outright uh, stalked and mistreated. They're challenged professionally. And then they sometimes are depicted as having a mental health issue. And then they're discharged. So this is absolutely abhorrent. Um, you know, the people who are actually committing these assaults, they get off scot-free a lot of the time because sexual assault in the military is treated as a breach of conduct, not a criminal offense. 
So that's a problem. It's time to protect our soldiers. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, my guest today knows, you know, unfortunately knows all too well about assault in the military. But Linda Nord, she dealt with much more than the psychologically damaging effects of military sexual assault. In order to qualify for these benefits, she had to retroactively prove that not only was she sexually assaulted, but a child that resulted from one of those rapes was actually forcibly removed and put up for adoption by the military. All of that went unreported. And Linda Nord shares her story with us today to let others know that they are not alone. Now, Linda, thank you for joining us. So, I mean, really, your story begins about 34 years ago. Let's just start at the beginning. I joined the military right out of high school, 18 years old. I got to my first duty station about November of 1979, it was Fort Ord, California. I had been there probably a month and a half. Um, the barracks were segregated at the time. I was down on the bottom floor of the barracks next to an exit door. Um, one night in late December, someone broke in and then my room was the, was the room next to the door and they broke into my room and I was raped. I reported the rape that night. However, the CQ office told me to wait and wait and I waited for several hours in the office and nothing happened and they told me to go back to my formation which was morning PT. Um, about a month and a half later I went to my first sergeant and CO and reported th that I had become pregnant from the rape and they told me in no uncertain terms that I had better not be pregnant because I could get an or article 15 and be put in Leavenworth for destruction of government property. And so you were that scared. government property, I guess? Yes, I was the government property. They um, told me not to say a word. So I went back to doing what I did. I ran PT. I did everything until eight and a half months pregnant and I couldn't do it anymore. I went back to them. I told them I can't do this anymore. At the time, I was in a medical unit, so you cannot tell me they did not know I was eight and a half months pregnant. Right. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to go to a physician. I wasn't allowed to do anything. They, when I went back there two weeks before I delivered, they took me off post to an attorney's office and told me I was to sign over my paternal rights or they would put me in Leavenworth. And if I went to Leavenworth, I was going to lose that child anyway. So at 19, scared to death, I had no choices. I wasn't allowed to tell anyone what was going on. I, I had no recourse. Now, today, they're trying to pass legislation to offer a third party to report because the chain of command seems to be the issue. And in my issue, it was a chain of command. It was my first sergeant and my CO who told me that they would put me in Leavenworth. Wow. So 34 years later, um, in 2010, I went to the VA because my husband lost his job. For medical, I needed medical at the time, so I went to the VA. When I was there, they handed me a pamphlet telling me um, that if I had ever been, or asking me if I had ever been sexually assaulted in the military, I was blown away. I, I said, you mean uh, to tell me I have rights? And they said, oh yeah, you have rights. Um, so I said, yes, I had been, and I told them the story. They immediately got me in touch in Iowa City with some counseling. Um, that counselor has since left the area. 
Um, I went for about six months in 2014, unable to see a counselor because they are so inundated that um, they have not, they don't have enough people to cover uh, soldiers with PTSD. I mm -hmm. have what is called PTSD to, to, due to MST, which is military sexual trauma. The VA, there's many facets to the VA. The VA has denied my client claim and said that I don't have it because I don't have any of the markers. When I was in the unit from 79 to 81, I received an ARCOM. I had heard rumor that um, I had an affair. That's how I became pregnant. I heard rumor that I slept around, or that's how I became pregnant. Um, if those were the issues and that's what, how I become pregnant, I would have never received an ARCOM. Okay, so um, let's... You can look at well, let's back it up just a little bit, uh, just, you know, because it's it's quite a long story here. And obviously, you know, this was 34 years ago. Uh, we're just talking about even today, people are still hesitant to come forward because of the repercussions that they face. And then, of course, you know, it's much you know worse 34 years ago. But so you went for some counseling for, you know, disability compensation. Then that is where they finally started to educate you on these rights that you have to get some counseling because you had never gone for any counseling for any sort of PTSD, anything like that. And then in July, your, your um, application was denied. And we actually have those documents that you sent. Uh, they say you reported that you were sexually assaulted twice during service. You reported the first assault was swept under the rug and also resulted in a pregnancy. You reported that the second assault was reported and resulted in a conviction of the offender which that was, we haven't mentioned that one yet, but you also reported continued harassment after the second incident to include denial of re-enlistment. Your service treatment records do not show complaints, treatment, counseling, or a diagnosis of a mental health condition or a pregnancy in 1979. So this was a VA report after you, you went there, you know, 30 something years later, and they denied these, this, your application for these disability benefits. Uh, basically saying, well, we looked in your records and it just doesn't look like anybody ever any, ever documented this, and so we don't believe you. And that's what you're saying there with that chain of command that blocked you from saying anything or reporting anything about that. And it was only because there was a second assault uh, that resulted in a conviction of someone who I guess had had multiple assaults on his record, um, you know, that they, that was even... I mean, that to me right there, that that wasn't even documented in your case is, is just really shocking. So talk to me a little bit about what you had to do next after the VA denies this application and, and says, well, we looked all through your records and there was nothing there. No, there is nothing in there, not anything from the first rape or the second rape. And the second rape did go to JAG. What I was told from JAG is they redact the... Um, victims' names so that the perpetrator cannot find their name if they are released from prison. So it makes it virtually impossible to prove that you were sexually assaulted. The first rape, um, we I had to dig. I had to literally convince a superior court judge in Monterey, California, which is 2,500 miles from where I'm at, that I am telling the truth so that he could unseal the adoption records. And I was able to prove that I had a child on base, Fort Ord, California, in 1980. Wow. And it, it, we even went to the National Archives and um, I petitioned for information from the hospital, and the hospital, Solace B. Hayes Hospital, Fort Ord, California, has no record of a child being born to, to myself at the time, Linda Perez, in 1980. So there's no record at the hospital. There's no medical record in my records. Where did the records go? Right. Why? How did a child be... You know, how did a child be delivered in a, in a military hospital and no record of it? Right. And a, an a adoption 
proceeding to take case, uh, to to happen with no documentation that there was an adoption that took place there through the military. I mean, that's what I'm talking about, some sort of a systemic cover-up protocol here to even go with there with I, the hospitals. And, and this isn't a, um, you know, this is real. This, is, this happened, really happened. It's not a conspiracy theory. It, this happened. I have documentation that this actually happened. Right. And it's hard. It has taken me four years to get this far. And the, the, the VA tells me that it takes three years to have um, an appeal looked at. So I started this process in 2010, and it is now 2015, and still nothing. And it was only because you remembered a name, I remembered hearing a name when you went to that meeting where they forced you to sign over your parental rights, that you just remembered a name, and it was through that process that you were able to do your own investigation uh, to find your baby girl. And so did you ever, you made contact Yes, we made contact. Um, we've had a couple of meetings. Uh, he went out and stayed at her home for a couple of weeks um, earlier this year while she had some surgery done so I could take care of the, the kids. Um, it's a slow going. It's, you know, it, it's a, there's a lot of hurt. Right. Um, I, I have a lot of hurt. Uh, so these people play God mm -hmm. in my life. And I'm the one paying the price. Right. And well, not only that, but obviously with whenever there is sexual assault involved, there's a lot of shame that people try to put on the victim. And then you're here now coming forward 30 something years later and they're they're saying, oh, you had an affair or you were, you know, sleeping around. And that's why this happened. And again, like you say, you your military records show that you performed well and you, <laughs> you know, not, and like you said, if, if you had had an affair or something, you would have been discharged dishonorably. Yes, I would have, especially back in 1979. They didn't want women back then. You have to remember the people that were in charge at that time that were like my CO and my first sergeant, those people had come out of Vietnam. And they, I hate to use the cliche, the old boys network, but back then it was the old boys network. Right. And that's still something that we're dealing with a little bit today. Now, I know that uh, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand and Barbara Boxer were trying to introduce uh, the Military Justice Improvement Act. It was going to be designed to change the way that the military prosecutes sexual violence crimes, uh, taking military rape cases outside of the chain of command and restricting commanding officers' power to set aside or overturn any convictions for sexual violence. So, I mean, that goes right in hand there with the old boys, old boys club is that everyone kind of covers up and protects each other while the victims of these sexual assaults are really ostracized, um, basically make you to where you want, you just want out and then you're left to suffer with PTSD. We have 20 something veterans committing suicide every single day. Uh, it's crazy. Well, so why are you coming forward now? Why do you want to speak out? What do you hope other people can gain from just hearing your story? Breaking my silence, it, the reason I want to break my silence is because we do have 20 veterans or women that, were, that are in the military committing suicide. I had read something about the Pentagon putting out that they're committing suicide because women are that join the military are prone to suicide. That's ludicrous. What really is happening is women are being assaulted and no one's doing anything about it. And the chain of command is the issue. Right. They need to remove it. They're trying to protect their career after 20, you know, they want their 20 years. I know that's why mine was done. You know, why they, they didn't, you know, do anything for me. They were protecting their career. My, I want other women to know that they have rights and they have help. They can go to the v, VA for help. They can contact me um, for help if they need to. I can, I have numbers. 
I have made mistakes I in my filing, so I know how to do just about the whole process because I've been through it. If I can save one woman or one man, even one man, it would all be worth it. Absolutely. Well, that's very honorable. Thank you so much for telling your story because it really, I mean, it's just one person, 20 something military veterans a day committing suicide. That number is, that's absolutely ludicrous and something needs to change. It's time to start supporting the military. One of my therapists told me that I'm not alone. I'm not the only one that a child has been taken wow. from them. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that doesn't even surprise me because of just the way that your case was handled and how the hospital could cover it up and no records anywhere. It's not like that was a one-off especially with, you know, 26,000 rapes and sexual assaults taking place in 2012 alone. And that's only, you know, with the ones that were being reported. Exactly. One out of seven victims even reporting their attack. So absolutely insane numbers there. And it is it's it's time to shine a light on what's going on. And there is a cover up. Well, we'll put your information up for people to get in touch with you, Linda. And again, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. I appreciate it. Really, I do. If we can save one woman or one man, that would be awesome. Now we're going to put up some resources for assistance. Those are all the numbers that you need to get you started. You can also get in contact with Linda. There's her email as well. There are a lot of resources out there. You are not alone and you do not need to be ashamed for being the victim of military sexual trauma. That's it for the show tonight. Thank you so much.